Your body, your mind, your life, these don't belong to you. So don't depend on them to bring true happiness. Immersed in endless work. Dapai became quiet and withdrawn after Ajahn Mun's departure. The joy and the excitement that pervaded her life ebbed and disappeared when she stopped meditating. Shy by nature, Dapai was not motivated to socialize. Instead, she threw herself into work, which kept her constantly occupied. Her hands were always busy, her body in constant motion. She planted cotton, combing and spinning the fluffy white balls into spools of dense thread, which she wove into fabric. She cultivated indigo trees, which were then cut and crushed to extract a dark blue color to dye the cloth with. She sat at the loom for hours, teasing out spools of silk and cotton thread to weave fabric, which she meticulously cut and sewed into looped skirts and loose-fitting blouses, and then dyed in pretty patterns. She continued to plant mulberry trees to raise silkworms. She spun the raw silk thread, weaving it into coarse garments, suitable for the rigorous conditions of village life. She showed her dexterity at basket weaving as well, shaping bamboo and rattan threads into light, durable basket wear with artistic flair. She sewed pillows and mattresses and stuffed them with soft cotton wool. She knitted woolen cloth for the winter chill. In her spare time, she mended time-worn garments with a sharp eye and a delicate touch. She knew all the best wild herbs by sight and smell, and, on day-long excursions in the cool forest, she picked handfuls of them, along with wild vegetables. Returning home in the evening with baskets full, Tapai chopped and sliced her findings, then cooked the raw roots and leaves with bits of meat or fish to create a wholesome, tasty meal. Tapai's multiple talents turned heads in the Putai community. Young women with traditional skills were lauded and considered to be exceptional brides. Besides that, she possessed other prized traits, such as stamina, dependability, loyalty to family and tradition, as well as respect for elders. Before long, suitors began to appear. One, in particular, a neighborhood boy one year younger than Dabai, named Bun Ma, was emboldened to make a proposal to her parents. Still deeply moved by Ajahn Mun's teaching, Dabai showed no interest in romantic affairs and had never thought seriously of marriage. But when her parents consented to Bun Ma's proposal, she was not prepared to disobey their wishes. Perhaps it was inevitable now. Part of this worldly life she must be content to live, for the time being. Tapai and Bun Ma were married in a traditional Putai ceremony early in the monsoon season of her seventeenth year. As tradition dictated, she moved in with her husband's extended family, who lived not far from her parents. There she stayed with them in a large wooden house built on stilts and with a peaked grass roof. Again, she was the youngest family member and was expected to shoulder the brunt of the daily workload. Tapai's tough and persistent temperament meant that she never shied away from hard work. But Bun Ma was a carefree, fun-loving man who liked to chat while the others did the work. He preferred to hire local girls to help plant and harvest his rice crops, often amusing himself by playfully flirting with them while his wife labored nearby, even gossiping to them about Tabai behind her back. Perhaps he was hoping for a jealous reaction, but she feigned indifference and kept quiet about his indiscretions. Tabai found herself immersed in endless work the work of being alive, the work of food and of shelter, the ceaseless tasks of a young wife. Awake before the sun rose, working quickly in pale candlelight, she kindled lumps of black charred wood heaped loosely in small earthenware stoves, fanning the flames until red-hot embers began to glow. Boiling water fed steam into a cone-shaped basket, which cooked the grains of sticky rice with the intense heat of its vapors. An entire day's supply was cooked at once, enough for three meals for her, her husband, and some extra for guests. Farm animals, many living in the backyard or on the packed earth underneath the house, required feed and water. Water was forever a difficult challenge. Neighbors shared communal wells located at intervals around the village. There the water was drawn by hand to fill wooden buckets, two at a time, which were carried back to the house, suspended from either end of a wooden pole balanced on one shoulder. The villagers went back and forth again and again, making many trips to fill the large ceramic storage barrels. It was an exhausting task, but it had to be done. Water was needed for drinking and washing, 
washing dishes, washing clothes, and washing dirt and grime from the body after another long, sweltering day. Village life was inextricably bound to the growing of rice. In turn, rice was dependent on the rains, the annual cycle of rejuvenation. Rain was auspicious. It was celebrated. But it also meant more work, more strenuous, inescapable labor. Plowing began in early May, when the fallow earth soaked up the first heavy downpours. Pairs of enormous water buffaloes were yoked to cumbersome wooden poles and driven repeatedly to one end of the field and back again to loosen the earth. Then they were driven back and forth yet again to trample the clods into mud. Rice seedlings were sprouted in nursery plots and carefully tended, often with water collected from a stream during dry spells, until the rice shoots were ready for planting. Planting was done in rows by groups of women in a timeless choreography. Bending at the waist, the village women walked backwards through thick, cloying mud to place the shoots into the ground. The rainy season transformed the countryside into a moist, green patchwork of intersecting rice fields overhung with skies that were heavy with rain. The surrounding hills grew thick with bamboo, and a scrim of fine drizzle softened the outlines of the lush landscape. Rice shoots stood in jagged rows above the still water in which the fields were submerged. The mornings were quiet and hazy with humid heat, and the evenings crackled with the sound of frogs croaking at the edge of the fields and geese clattering in the ponds. Each rainy season came with its set of anxieties for Tapai. She worried about too little rain in August, when the southwesterly winds began to subside, and flooding in September, when typhoons pounded the land and the rains came down hard, slashing the countryside in sheets. Roads, made muddy by the rains and churned up by carts and water buffaloes, strained the endurance of man and beast. The rain fell inexorably with heavy downpours, followed at times by gentle drizzle. Through it all, the rice grew green and tall. The rice flowered in mid-October. The fields became a sea of golden tassels, undulating softly in the autumn breeze. Dapai joined the whole family as they crowded into the fields to cut rice stalks at harvest time. With quick downward thrusts, family members slashed plants with machetes, piling the sheaves on the empty ground between the rows. For weeks, everyone toiled in the bright sunshine, stooped at the waist, blades rising and falling as they moved down the rows. The sheaves of rice, laden with seeds, were then laid out on the ground and left to dry in the October sunlight. Dabai's work was now part of her new family's livelihood. She kept house and worked the fields selflessly without complaint. She endured painstaking weeks, pulling out weeds and shoring up dikes. After the harvest, she camped with her husband near the fields to keep vigil over the new crop, the next year's food supply, and to wait for the grains to dry thoroughly so that threshing could begin. Since threshing and winnowing was woman's work, this meant that Tapai and the other women had to spend more chilly nights sleeping in the open when the day's work was over. Hour upon hour, the women arched backward and bent forward, straining at their waists as they worked to loosen the grain. Lifting sheaves of rice high into the air with both arms, the women thrashed them repeatedly against the ground until the seeds dislodged from the stems to form piles of loose, coarse grain. The loose grain was then winnowed, using large round trays woven from criss-crossing ribbons of split bamboo. Each heavy trayful was heaved repeatedly into the air until the wispy chaff scattered with the wind. Dried, threshed, and winnowed, the new rice was loaded onto massive wooden carts drawn by a team of water buffaloes and hauled to the village, where it was stored loose in the family's small storage barns.